talking about the untuning of the sky, ideas of music and English poetry. Hmm. Now, page 122, image, music as image. Uh -huh. If Davis's metaphors are traditional, however, it, and if most humanistic Humanist poetry in praise of music seems to draw upon little more than a stock of illusion. It is not to suggest that there was no invention in the treatment of musical themes by Elizabethan poets. Uh, the purely technical problems dealt with by practical musicians in their own occasional verses and the speculative essays of the non-professional musician in polemical or philosophical poems tend to keep to separate styles of diction and separate vocabularies and stocks of illusion. But even early in the century, we can see occasional uses of musical imagery that prefigure later poetic styles. An early 19th century poem on the harmony of birds. Uh -huh. First printed, 1551, for example, contains some interesting mixtures of old and new devices. The poems describes a gathering of birds uh, and proceeds to treat of each species in a separate stanza. The lines are often ma ma macaronic, macaronic in a late Medieval manner, the puns are occasionally arresting and graphic, as, for example, the play on parte in the lines depicting the song and flight of the lark, where the word is used in a specifically musical sense as well as in the more general one of task and role. Poem quote. Then sates the lark, because my part is upward to ascend and down to rebound uh, towards the ground and singing to descend. Hmm. There's the poem again. Then said the lark, because my part is upward to ascend and down to rebound towards the ground and singing to descend. An unusual interlingual pun of almost a Joycean style occurs in the first, last two lines of a later stanza. Quote, then all in one voice they did all rejoice. Omnis vos iste, Chang changing their key, changing their key, from ut to re, et to rex glory Christe. <laughs> I'll read the poem again. Then all in one voice they did all rejoice. Omnis vos iste, changing their key from utere, e tu rex glory Christe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But perhaps the most remarkable figure in the whole piece is one which seems almost to adapt the turns made on the colors of musical notation in the lark lacking field proverbs and in Cornish's poem here the black and red ink become the colors of mourning and blood uh, respectively as if suggested by an implied pun on the word pricky prick prick <sighs> The osso uh, did prick uh, her notes all thick uh, with blacky ink and with red. Uh -huh. There's the talking about the birds here. The osso did prick her notes all thick with black ink and with red. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're analyzing the birds' harmony and with like. Facion with Christe in his passion from the foot, foot to the crown of the head. There is almost baroque grotesquerie to these lines, however, which is by no means typical of its period. 
One of the most common sources of musical imagery in the early Tudor period, and on the other hand, consists in the punning use of musical terms, which is made to extend the length of a poem. The best example of this is probably that of some verses by John Redford on the subject of the mean. The mean. This term is employed in connection with English music of the 15th through the 17th centuries to designate the middle part in a polyphonic composition. In the earlier period, the three voices of the most common compositional scheme were designated treble, mean, and tenor. Reading from top to bottom, Redford's poem suggests that the mean part, often notated in a black notation as opposed to the white of the other parts, was often used to conceal some basic compositional device, such as a contus firmus. The general intention of the whole word play is to associate the musical part with the Aristotelian ethical mean. The point is driven home again and again throughout the long and rather pedantic verbal quibble, not unworthy at times of Shakespeare's holy ferns. Uh, poem quote. Long, here's a long poem. Hmm. Red, this must be Redford. Long have I been singing man, and sundry parts of have I sung. But one part, since I first began, since I first began, I could nor can sing, old nor young. The mean I mem, which part showeth well, above all parts most to excel. The bass and treble are extremes, the tenor stayeth stirred sturdily. The cow counter rangeth then, me seems. The mem, mem, men, mean, must make our melody. Whereby the mean declareth well, all, above all parts, most to excel. Mark well the manner of the mean, and thereby time and tune our song. Unto the mean, where all parts lean. All parts are kept from singing wrong. Through singing man take this nut well. Yet doth the mean in thee they excel. The mean in compass is all is so large that every part must join thereto. Yet it hath an air in every barge to sing, to say, to think, to do. Of all these parts, this part showeth well. Above all parts, most to excel. The mean is so commodious that sang we but that part alone. The mean is more melodious than all those parts lacking that one. Thereby the mean compareth well. Among all parts, most to excel. The mean is loosey. The mean is gain in wealth and in advertising. The mean in health, the mean in pain, the mean meaneth always equality. This is the mean who meaneth well of our parts most to excel to me and mine with all the rest. And God grant grace with hearty voice to sing the mean that meaneth best. <laughs> All parts in the best to rejoice, which mean and meaning meaneth well, the mean of means that doth excel. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Very good. You like that poem? Huh. I like that poem. The mean? He's talking about the middle voice or something. The mean is there's three voices and a kind. It's a three a three part song, okay, so you have three singers, let's say. It's called a polyphonic composition. Treble, mean and tenor. So you have the treble means like soprano, mean means like in the middle and tenor. It's almost like an alto singer. <laughs>
But uh, it's like my mom, the Alto. <laughs> She's the Alto. Through the notion of the mean. You see, the mean is also a philosophical sound concept. The mean, right? How do you spell that? M-E-A-N. Do you have the of concept the of the mean, right? In philosophy. He's probably implying it in music. The general point above musica upica cabernatus is being made a point made elsewhere by Redford. This is a Redford poem himself and by other early humanist writers on music and on education. By the second stanza, the metaphoric value of the statements about the mean takes over completely so that the mean must make our melody. <laughs> and later on, the mean is so commodious that sang we but that part alone are ethical statements rather than musical trivia. See, if you have the mean like a few... Oh, uh, what's an example of the mean? Like moderation and everything. <laughs> During the course of the century, musical imagery is non-didactic poetry, particularly in those poems where music is not the formal subject, tends to confine itself more to the use of figures and evolving, involving instruments in some of their traditional associations than it does to the use of those drawn from the more abstract musical conceptions. Nevertheless, there are many examples of these general musical metaphors in both verse and prose of the Elizabethan era. One of the simpler types involves the literalization of abstract concord or harmony into musical consonants, much in the same way that Redford used the notion of the mean. The musical notion is employed almost as an allegorical figure of Concordia. Might with sweet harmony. Sweet, because in tune, rather than merely gentle and pleasant, serving an abstract purpose. And thus, in one of the songs from Sir Philip Sidney's Arcandia, 1593, a shepherd refers to his old music, in other words, poetry, teacher as follows. He said, the music best, think, thilk, thick powers, pleased was jumpy jump, concord between our wit and will where highest notes to God lines are raised, uh -huh. and lowest sink down, not down to jot of ill. Jumpy is exact and even, and the concord that mediates between our wit and will, or reason and feeling, is the traditional harmony of the soul. But the ethical point here connects specifically with music and not for the purpose of praising music and displaying its virtues to an, some attacker, but to associate both music and ethics with poetry. We shall presently examine this tradition, particularly in Sidney's writing. We're stopping here. We had read from Redford. And we read about the mean, and we read a poem about the mean, and polyphonic music. And the subject was music as image. Hmm. That's very good stuff, I know. <laughs> it's from the classical scholars of top scholar, <laughs> John Hollander. We're trying to retune the sky.